now, E10 Action News. Eric Rabe and Keystone Country's number one news team with the area's best report of news, sports, and weather. Reporting Action News, here is John McClintock. Merry Christmas. We're in for a snowfall, and they were pumping gas for charity, but the big story on Action News, Christmas Day, 1976. Snow is falling across Keystone Country as Christmas 1976 winds to a close. We should get a fair amount, and the resulting picture postcard will make an already ideal weekend perfect. For Christians in the area, celebrations of the birth of the Christ child began toward midnight last night in hundreds of area churches. A torchlight processional at midnight last night began what has to be one of the most beautiful ceremonies in Altoona in recent years. Over 1,300 worshipers jammed Altoona Cathedral for a mass highlighted by a 60-voice choir and 15 symphony musicians performing segments of Mozart's Mass in C minor and the Coronation Mass. Bishop James Hogan of the Altoona Johnstown Diocese officiated at the Mass. The 4,700 pipe organ joined with the orchestra and choir to serenade the Christ child and those who came to celebrate his birth. The congregation was smaller in Ebensburg, Cambria County, only because the parish church could hold no more. During the vigil, the congregation listened to the boys' choir, which may be called the pride of that parish. Monsignor Francis McKay and four other priests served that Mass. Like most of us, the two most important men in the country were spending Christmas Day with their families. President Ford was in Vail, Colorado, where he planned to open some gifts, and Jimmy Carter was in Plains visiting with friends and relatives. A Carter Christmas without Miss Lillian? Unthinkable. So, before the sun was up, the Carter clan called on Miss Lillian in her hospital room, and they gave her a massage shower head to ease the arthritic pain which put her in bed. Governor, how does it feel to uh, spend your first, first Christmas as president-elect? Well, it feels the same as it always has. For the the only difference Christmas. is that, uh, that instead of being at Mother's house for breakfast, we had to come to the hospital. But uh, that's the only difference. After breakfast at the Best Western Motel in Americas, the president-to-be talked about the gift he'd gotten from his wife, a painting by one of his favorite Georgia artists, Butler Brown. He gave Rosalind a robe and nightgown to be worn, he said, at the White House. And nine-year-old Amy got her own telephone. First uh, push-button telephone in this part of the, of the country. Does it work? It works, yeah. It's a real telephone <laughs> for her room. And then Would she got a dollhouse. So too, with all the furniture. Are there any surprises in those Christmas presents? Well, all those things were surprises to me. I've wanted a Butler Brown painting for a long time. Ford's exchanged Christmas gifts early this morning. The president gave Mrs. Ford a skirt and jacket and a gold veil charm. Mrs. Ford gave her husband five turtleneck sweaters and a vest. A White House press release indicated that Susan had given her father a black bath towel with the initials MCP, standing for male chauvinist pig. But when the president appeared today, along with Senator John Glenn and Santa Claus, he didn't seem to know anything about the towel. <laughs> I don't comment until I see it. <laughs> I didn't know about it either. I didn't deliver it. <laughs> uh, I got Santa. Santa.
After two days off the slopes because of bruises sustained from earlier spills, President Ford was a bit rusty, failing to see a roped-off area. Friends of the president have been telling him that he's skiing too fast and too often, and that he doesn't seem to realize that he is 63 years old. All of us can remember back to a time when we got exactly the present we wanted to get. It seems Christmas is a special treat for the children, what with the blinking lights and the wrapping paper. For them, sometime after dawn this morning was a magic hour. Across the country, millions of Santa Clauses were probably up until 3 in the morning, putting together what the average youngster can tear apart in two minutes. There's a moment just after the youngster wakes up and just before he gets his hand on the present, when the living room and Christmas tree look like a picture. But moments later, with wrapping paper and ribbons askew and toys littered wall to wall, you just hope inside the neighbors don't come to visit for a few hours. Sometimes it seems the toy makers and children have some agreement about providing lots of little pieces to spread around and no batteries to make things go. But despite the harried rush and the resulting mess, the look on a child's face is always worth whatever it took to produce it. It wasn't too long ago that families would hop in the car on Christmas Eve and go around and look at everyone's display of Christmas lights. And you usually didn't have to go much further than a couple of blocks to see some beautiful sights. Well, the energy crisis has made a most elaborate displays a piece of history, but now there's something new that's really something old that's taken its place. An ancient Spanish tradition calls for setting out the luminaries to guide the Christ child to earth. The lights are simply a candle placed in a paper bag weighted with sand. But growing numbers of people are participating in the tradition. Last night, hundreds upon hundreds of luminaries were seen in the Wenwood section of Altoona near the campus of Penn State, also in Hollidaysburg and other areas of Keystone Country. The luminaries line the streets and sidewalks of the area. Aside from the religious significance, the candlelight creates a mood of warmth on a cold night, which colored electric lights and illuminated Santa Clauses just cannot seem to match. You could probably ask a hundred people what Christmas means to them and get a hundred different answers, but at the core of the annual celebration is the religious theme. While whole neighborhoods deck the halls with lights and candles, residents of one area added a special touch. Residents of the Shadyside Avenue section of Huntington cooperated with the Shadyside Avenue Free Methodist Church there to add life to the traditional nativity scene. About 22 participants worked last night and tonight from 7 till 9 p.m. to reenact the birth of Christ. This is the eighth year of the program there. In addition to the players and the scene itself, a group of carolers sang to nearly 2,000 people each night. The scene will also be open to the public in front of that church tomorrow night. About 25 homes in that area also joined the tradition of setting out luminaries on Christmas Eve. A Portage man is in the Cambria County Jail tonight, accused of holding his girlfriend hostage with a shotgun. 28-year-old John J. Voss was arrested at his home by Portage Township Police just before 4 o'clock this morning. The incident apparently was the result of a domestic feud. Police Lieutenant Mark Stovich arrived at the scene, allegedly finding a loaded shotgun pointed at him. He put a call in for assistance, and Assistant Chief Paul Siebelik responded. From a distance of 10 feet, it's reported Siebelik talked Voss into handing over the gun while it was pointed at the officers. Voss is in jail in lieu of $2,500 bond. On any holiday, there's a gloomy side of the picture, and Christmas has been no exception. Already hundreds have died on the nation's highways, and fires have taken a deadly toll. Late today in Japan, 15 people were killed in an explosion uh, when an explosion hit a club where a Christmas party was underway. And last night in Chicago, at least a dozen people were killed in a Latin neighborhood building that was also struck by a fire. But the nice thing about Christmas is it's also a time to help the unfortunate. You probably never thought of your local gasoline station attendant as Santa Claus, but year after year, an Altoona man becomes just that. John Wogan pumps gas, and the Easter Seal Society gets the profits. Gasoline buyers came in droves today for the third year in a row to Wogan's mobile station at Kettle Street and Walton Avenue. Wogan is donating all of the profits from today's sales to the Blair County Easter Seal Society. All of the work and gas pumping was done by volunteers, and they fairly swarmed over the cars as they rolled in. Unfortunately, Wogan was injured in a traffic accident last night and could not pump gas himself. Many of the motorists have come every year, but some have only started. Because the profits are being donated? You do it every year. No, this is the first year. I saw an advertise on television the other night. I need to get this because I was in the other night and I read your sign. 
So I thought, no, I'll wait until Christmas and fill up. Donate to the cripples, children. Do you do it often? Yeah. Every year? Yeah. How much gas do you get? Oh, I'm filling up. I don't have to do much. I'm filling up as much as I can today. Donations of money to the uh, cripple children. You ever done it before? Uh, yes, I have. I've uh, done work for them, uh, raising money and things like that. You got to get it filled up. Uh, hopefully so if this line uh, <laughs> ceases down. Last year, Wogan donated over $500 to the society with the help of 35 volunteers. The sports world has pretty much taken a break over the Christmas holiday. There was a bowl game, and it was supposed to be pretty neat, but most of the fans decided to leave before the game was over. We're talking about the Fiesta Bowl in Arizona, where Oklahoma walked over the University of Wyoming 41-7. Today's college football really only served to whet the uh, appetite of the pro football fan. Tomorrow is the game, the one that will probably overshadow the Super Bowl. The Pittsburgh Steelers and the Oakland Raiders will tangle to see who will play in the Super Bowl. Every time the teams meet, there's fireworks, and tomorrow's contest promises to be an explosive game. Will the luck of Kenny Stav uh, Stabler overcome the Pittsburgh Steelers' defense? Well, tune in tomorrow. Why are all these Oakland fans lining up in the middle of the night to buy tickets to the playoff game with Pittsburgh? Maybe they're masochists. They must remember two years ago when the Raiders had the playoff game won until Pittsburgh's Franco Harris wound up with a bobbled Oakland pass in his hands and ran it back for a touchdown, a play that's since come to be known as the Immaculate Reception. Or last year's playoff game, when the Steelers did it to the Raiders all over again, almost out of force of habit. And this year, the odds makers agree it's likely to be the same sad story for Oakland. Somebody always seems to get it in the neck when the Raiders come to town. They play a, well, spirited brand of football. In this year's regular season game, Oakland's cornerback George Atkinson spirited his forearm into the head of Steeler wide receiver Lynn Swan. Swan wound up with a concussion. Pittsburgh coach Chuck Noll pilloried Atkinson so much in the public press that Atkinson's suing him for $3 million. The Raiders say they just play clean, hard football. Their enemies say they play dirty. One thing for sure, they don't play favorites. In last week's playoff game against New England, which the Raiders won with two touchdowns in the closing minutes, Atkinson, who's becoming something of a hitman for the Raiders, broke the nose of the Patriots' tight end, Russ Francis. The Steelers have now begun issuing dark threats about Sunday, intimating that if Atkinson tries any more of that, they'll give him good reason for a lawsuit, assault and battery. So whatever the score, the Oakland-Pittsburgh game is likely to be worth the watching for those who like their violence on television. With the Raiders and the Steelers, it's not whether you win or lose, it's whether you've got blue crossed. Richard? Most of us would rather have seen it happen last night, but who's going to complain? It looks like we're having a white Christmas, even though it is coming a little bit late in the day. Snow started falling early this evening, and the National Weather Service has issued a traveler's advisory. The weatherman says we can expect two to four inches of snow around Altoona. There had been a heavy snow warning, but it has now been downgraded. Tomorrow, look for occasional snow, windy, and steadily falling temperatures. By tomorrow night, the temperature should be about 15 degrees. On Monday, look for snow flurries as Keystone Country becomes a windy ice box with a high of 20 degrees. Looks like we're having the first storm of the season. The present temperature, 33 degrees. Wrapping up the news, a family in Cambria County must think they met the real Santa Claus last night, and maybe they did. The Santa Claus was Merrill Apple and his wife of Hollandtown, Cambria County. They heard a nearby family wasn't going to have a Christmas, so they got together about 10 friends and collected some gifts. Then Merrill Apple put on a Santa Claus outfit and delivered the presents to the family. There may be Scrooges in the world tonight, but we don't know where they are. Christmas is a very special day of days to thousands of Americans. Many people are born on Christmas Day every year, but Paul Schrader of Indiana, Pennsylvania went one better. Both he and his daughter, Carol Vaughn of Evansburg, were born on Christmas. Today he celebrated his 71st birthday, but Mrs. Vaughn would not allow her age to be named. She said she was 29 and holding. And then there's Mrs. Kay Autry of Raleigh, North Carolina. For the last 26 years, the woman has been receiving a Christmas gift in the mail. And the only identification on it is a card that says that the sender is Santa Claus. Mrs. Autry says it all started when she was six years old. And when she got married a few years ago, the Christmas gift that year was a silver pin that included her new initials. 
But Mrs. Autry's story is not half as strange as that of Ed Clinch of Peoria, Illinois. It seems for the last 28 years, Clinch has been receiving coconuts for Christmas, and he doesn't know where they're coming from either. This year, the coconut was delivered by the mayor of his town. But other years, it came by helicopter, fire engine, even local radio personalities would come to his door with his coconut. Clinch says he's getting used to the odd gifts, and he said, quoting here, heck, just let everyone have a Merry Christmas and a happy coconut. And finally, from everyone at Channel 10, here's a Christmas card from New York.